It's one of the most closely watched Senate races in the country. Republican incumbent Senator Tom Tillis and Democratic challenger Cal Cunningham face off for a second time. Thanks so much for joining us for Post Debate Live. I'm CBS 17 anchor Marius Payton. A lot of eyes are on this race. In our Next Star Emerson College poll, we asked North Carolina voters if the race for U.S. Senate were held today, who they would vote for. 49% said Democrat Cal Cunningham, 43% said Republican incumbent Senator Tom Tillis, 8% are undecided. And the race is so close, those undecided voters could make the difference. Tonight, you get to hear from them live from Charlotte. Plus, right here in the CBS 17 studios in Raleigh, we're joined by two analysts. They're breaking down how tonight's debate will impact November's elections. But first tonight, we want to get straight to the action out in Charlotte. That's where Brian Blakely from Fox 46 joins us live with reaction from the group of undecided voters. Brian. That's right, Marius. Thank you. I'm here with the group of undecided voters here live in this room in Charlotte who just watched the debate between Cal Cunningham and Tom Tillis. These are all registered independent voters who have not made up their mind and how they're going to vote come November. And they're all brought in by an independent licensed research agency for us here tonight to watch tonight's debate and react on what they saw. And one of the big things that they reacted to early was talking about filling the Supreme Court justice nominee with the passing of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. First off, let's go ahead and listen to some sound here from earlier with Cunningham and tell us. Mr. Cunningham, in 2016, President Obama nominated a Supreme Court justice in March of an election year. Do you think President Trump has that same right? 60 seconds. Look, uh, voting is already underway here in North Carolina, and I think we need to hear from the people of our state. And then the next Senate and the next president should take up the very consequential and very weighty issue of a lifetime appointment to the highest court in the land. I know these judges uh, well because I serve on Judiciary Committee and I've already seen them before the committee as circuit court judges. The president took the bold step of saying, this is what I stand for, the American people can decide based on the ones that I put on the list. Joe Biden is ducking the question. Cal Cunningham is supporting Joe Biden. We all know that they're gonna be radical left judges who will vote against the Second Amendment. They will vote uh, for keeping our schools and our and our businesses shut down. They will be literally, if, if Cal Cunningham has his way, they will be legislators in robes. All right, back here with our independent voters here, in, in the sided voters in this room tonight. We gave them each one of these little dials right here, and that's how they reacted to whatever was being said tonight by Cal Cunningham or Tom Tillis during the debate on the issues that mattered to them most. And getting back to when they were talking about the Supreme Court vacancy that's being uh, nominated by President Trump coming up on Saturday, they have very strong reactions, and specifically with the females and the, from the males. May, females reacted very unfavorably to what was going on especially with Tom Tillis talking about how they wanted to fill that nomination. And I want to go ahead and talk to some of those voters right now with Greta up here up front. How did you react to that and how this is all playing out with filling of the Supreme Court nomination with Ruth Bader Ginsburg passing away? Uh, I feel that the president does have a right to nominate uh, a justice at this point, And I feel like it's the other side is just, you know, out of line uh, in that area. And that President Obama did the same thing. And uh, the other side is just very unhappy. Uh, the other side is very unhappy. One of the things we saw was strongly uh, uh, favoring uh, going one side uh, when they talked about flip-flopping back and forth between what happened in 2016 mm -hmm. and now to today. And you feel that uh, that, th that doesn't bother you in any way. It's on one side back and forth between political no. parties? No, I think you just don't want another conservative person in there. Okay. All right. Let's go back here. And Keisha, what's your thoughts on that? Although Obama did select someone in 2016, they actually did not allow that candidate to go through. So I think that the incoming presidential candidate should select that, and we should not be forcing that vote at this point, considering that there's a lot of fraudulent things going on with the mail ballots, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I feel like it would be something that should happen in 2021 and not 2020. Okay. And when you were watching the debate tonight, what kind of reaction did you have? We noticed that it was females in large part that were reacting unfavorably to how things were shaken out. What about you? Uh, I'm still kind of on the fence, but more so leaning towards the Cal Cunningham side of things, his approach, as well as Biden's approach for the Ginsburg uh, selection. But again, like I say, it should be done in 2021 and not 2020. All right. Shereen, want to go back to you? 
I feel the same way. I feel like this decision should be thought out. It shouldn't be rushed. And I think rushing it is strictly political. Strictly political. Mm -hmm. All right, Shereen, thank you for that answer. A group of undecided voters here talking about one of the key issues tonight, as you can see, which is filling the Supreme Court vacancy with the passing of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Just one of a number of issues that we're going to touch on here with our undecided voters who are going to have a big part in the say in the election. Eight percent of undecided voters are out there in North Carolina. They make a difference when it comes to the polls come November. We'll send it back to you guys in Raleigh. Marius? Brian, thank you. Differing opinions there. Let's continue our coverage tonight live from our studios in Raleigh with CBS 17's Russ Bowen, and he's joined by two analysts who are taking an in-depth look at the debate. Russ. Thanks so much, Marius, and thank you both for being here. First, we have April Dawson, an associate dean and law professor at North Carolina Central University. April specializes in constitutional law and voting rights. She also hosts a weekly radio show and podcast. We also have Mitch Kokai, who is a former government reporter for both radio and television, and now serves as senior political analyst for the John Locke Foundation and the Carolina Journal. But April, I'm going to start with you. You teach a class in the Supreme Court every semester. I got the sense from these two folks they just talked to, these undecided voters, they came in already quite informed. It sounds like the candidates really didn't do anything, at least as far as those two voters are concerned, to change their mind. Yeah, I think you're right. I think um, this is true of so many individuals who are thinking about who to vote for. Their minds are already made up. Um, Justice Ginsburg was such an icon uh, that people have a strong reaction about how her seat is to be filled and whether her dying wish should be um, respected, which is to have her seat filled by the next president. Mitch. The biggest impact I think this is going to have is on Tom Tillis and the Republican base. We know that Tom Tillis's biggest struggle is that he's been running behind Donald Trump in the polls, and that is because there are a lot of people among conservatives and Republicans in North Carolina who don't trust Tom Tillis as much as they trust Donald Trump, whether you think that's a good or a bad thing. And the fact that Tom Tillis has come out and said, yes, as a member of the Judiciary Committee, I am ready to go ahead and uh, take a vote on whoever Donald Trump puts forward because I've seen the list of the potential candidates. I think that's going to bolster him with the Republican and conservative base. I don't think it has much of an impact on other people. People who were against this are still going to be against Tillis and for Cunningham. People who are on the fence probably don't uh, follow much of the back and forth on this much at all. April, do you think they did enough to motivate their own voters who've already gone out and voted for either candidate to get out and campaign for them on this very issue? Yes, I think so. Um, again, this is an issue where people have very strong feelings um, and they know that there are people who have not yet decided who may be on the fence. And so getting out and being able to let your voice be heard, uh, we're seeing that right here at the studio. So I think a number of people are being galvanized. Mitch, is it enough to raise money overnight? It could be. I mean, I think uh, this is going to be one of those debates where people will go back and say, first of all, no one made some major gaffe that's mm -hmm. going to really cost them. But I think uh, both sides are going to be able to point to things in the debate things that they got uh, across that they think are good points, things that they think the other person said that are just so unconscionable that they're going to say, give us 10 bucks, give us 20 bucks. So you're going to see the fundraising on both sides of the fence. Very interesting to see what they say about the other questions as well. Marius, I'll toss it back to you. Russ, thank you. The U.S. Senate post-debate show continues live from Charlotte and Raleigh. Still to come, we check back in with our group of undecided voters in Charlotte. And later, we will hear from both candidates one-on-one. -on -one. Thanks for staying with us for Post Debate Live. We're coming to you live from Raleigh as well as Charlotte tonight. Now in the Queen City, a group of undecided voters are weighing in about both candidates. Brian Blakely from Fox 46 is standing by with them. Brian. Marius, thank you. Yeah, here with our group of undecided voters and some of the big issues tonight that they're watching with the Cunningham and Tillis debate happen to be health care. Which, which party is going to manage that best moving forward with the election? Let's go ahead and listen to what the candidates had to say. Well, one proposal would be to vote on the COVID relief package because the more people we get back to work, the more people who go back to the health care that they like on their jobs. Unlike Cal Cunningham, who supports Medicare for all, that would literally kick people off of the health care that they like on their jobs. 
if we get the economy moving, it's going to be the fastest way to get more people back on the health care rolls. And then we need to continue to look at ways to reduce costs and make insurance more affordable. The problem I have with the Affordable Care Act is people have policies that they can't use unless they're in a catastrophic uh, condition because they can't pay the deductibles, the copay, and the out-of-pocket expense. We must build on the Affordable Care Act. I'm going to fight to protect pre-existing conditions. People with pre-existing conditions, Senator Tillis has voted to take it away. I fought for and would advocate for expanding Medicaid in this state. Senator Tillis, when he was Speaker of the House, he blocked it. Then he went to Washington and voted to take that option away, not just from our state, but all 38 states that have expanded Medicaid. I'm going to work for lower prescription drug costs. With $400,000 in PAC money from Big Pharma, Senator Tillis has blocked or voted against uh, opposed bipartisan efforts to bring down the cost of prescription drugs. All right, I want to talk to Noel here. We had talked earlier about health care being one of your big hot topics that you wanted to see about going into the election and with tonight's debate. You have two kids. Tell me why you're concerned. Well, as we can see, we're in the middle of a pandemic. I have to make sure that my family's safe. We all have to make sure our families are safe. How many people out there have really crummy minimum wage jobs where they've They've got something under the Affordable Care Act that they can't even afford to take their kids to the doctor to get checked out. And that's, not e that's a daily thing, not even during a pandemic. If we had universal health care, hey, nobody would have to worry about pre-existing conditions. That's off the table. Chris? Uh... I'm worried about uh, universal health care. I don't know what that looks like. Um, I'm, uh, I'm nervous that the, uh, the government has poor roads, uh, poor other systems. I'm, I'm nervous that uh, government-run health care would, uh, would not be as successful as what we have today. Um, I know uh, I'm very fortunate in my lifetime. Uh, I feel I have very good health care, and I would like that to continue. Yeah, and I think uh, Tillis was harping on Cunningham, saying he's going to be for, for, for universal health care. Cunningham came out to decide tonight that he was not for that. But one of the things that also was talking about the mask mandates here, that was a big hot topic issue about whether it's going to be a national mask mandate. Cunningham says he is for that. Tillis didn't really answer that. Christian, what's your thoughts? Yeah, so one thing I noticed, too, is that Tom didn't really give a good answer with it. He sort of implied that he wasn't really against it, and he, he was for maybe states deciding whether or not they should have mask mandates, but Cal seemed definitely strong for, yes, there should be one. Um, I personally don't believe that there should be a mandate, that it should be up to the individual as well as businesses where people go into forcing them, say, hey, if you want to come and shop with us, you need to wear a mask. Okay. Tiani, what about you? Uh, as we all have masks on here tonight, of course. <laughs> yes. Uh, this is a topic for me that, um, I'm, well, I should say for everyone, is a pretty hot button topic right now. Um, for me, I think it's really important. It was very frustrating to watch in that debate. Um, Tom Tillis didn't really answer the question. I wish he would have given a yes or no. Um, so at least we knew where he stood. Um, the constant flipping it and, 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 you know, making accusations that wasn't really answering the question. So for those of us who haven't quite made a decision, that didn't really help me, other than just to know he doesn't really have a position. Okay. So. And Joseph, I want to get you in here, too. I agree with her in regards to that. I believe that uh, Tom Taylor should have just come out and said, yes, I am for a mass mandate, a federal mass mandate, or no, I'm not. Um, like right now, I I very much doubt him either way because I can't trust if you can't answer a question straight up. <laughs> Ask the question, you want to get the answers right. That's definitely what bothers a lot of voters in here, I know, from watching you guys earlier tonight. All right, thank you guys. We're going to get back to uh, our undecided voters and all the topics we have. Marius, we'll send it back to you live in Raleigh. Brian, thank you. Now, continuing our coverage tonight live from Raleigh, CBS 17's Russ Bowen, and he's joined by two analysts who are taking a deeper look at the debate. And, Russ, very interesting to hear what the voters had to say. Yeah, and very interesting to watch that dial, April and Mitch. Uh, I noticed when they got to prescription drugs and trying to keep, keep those drugs you know, available and affordable, we saw a real bump in the dial. People were very interested in what the candidates had to say. They wanted to hear about how they would make uh, prescription drugs more affordable and accessible. Uh, Mitch, did they explain it well enough, though? 
No, I don't think they really did. I mean, I, I, people perked uh, up with interest because they talked about prescription drugs. I was a little surprised that the Medicaid expansion didn't get a higher uh, notch on the dial because that has actually polled relatively well in North Carolina, but it was fairly steady whether Tom Tillis was talking about not being in favor of some of these things that Cal Cunningham has talked about or when Cal Cunningham straight out said he supported Medicaid expansion. You didn't see a whole lot of, uh, of movement one way or the other. The biggest thing that came out of that last segment to me, which is bad news for Senator Tillis, is that people didn't like the fact that he wouldn't just say straight up or down whether he supported a mask mandate. And that fits in with some of the criticism that Tom Tillis has had from the left and from the right, and that is people being concerned about not knowing where he stands. This is something that he has used in his campaign against uh, Cal Cunningham, saying he's going to say one thing and do something else based on what his uh, political history shows us. But people who were watching that debate, who uh, say they're undecided voters, didn't like the fact that Tom Tillis seemed to be doing the same thing. Yeah, April, it's true. It did seem like when we really first saw passion tonight from those voters, it was about ma the mask mandate. They just want clear guidance as to what to do, it sounded like, and they didn't get it. Right, exactly. And and I was surprised as well that the, you know, the their enthusiasm for the responses about uh, Medicare for all um, and about the uh, just in terms of the what the candidates were talking about in terms of their view on health care. Um, they were really lackluster in their response, even though we know this is an incredibly important issue. Um, the other thing that struck me was with respect to the prescription drug costs, uh, the dials went up significantly for the women, not quite as much mm -hmm. for the men. And it's been just interesting to see how uh, each candidate plays differently with uh, the undecided voters, depending upon their gender. Fairly quickly here, uh, Mitch, do you think it's just because the Medicare issue is and Medicaid issue are so complex, healthcare is so complex that folks sort of turn it off when they start hearing too much detail? They just want to know what you're going to do. If people really don't know what the difference is between the two programs, what they cover, I mean, I think the, the one uh, undecided voter, Noel, was the one who said, look, you know, I, get, get rid of this mess. Let's just have something so that everyone is not going to be ruined by their health care problems. And I think a lot of people think that. And when you hear Medicare for all, Medicaid expansion, they don't really know the details and would rather just someone solved it for them. Sounds like can't, both candidates have more work to do in the coming weeks. All right, Marius. Russ, thank you. Still to come, we're one on one with Democratic candidate Cal Cunningham. You will hear that interview. And we will revisit the group of undecided voters in Charlotte. You're watching Post Debate Live on CBS 17, your local election headquarters. Right now, one of tonight's moderators, Bob Buckley from WGHP Fox 8, is sitting down with Democratic Senate candidate Cal Cunningham. Bob. All right, you know, uh, Mr. Cunningham, this is kind of one of those things like you just got done with a big game in the Super Bowl, and they grabbed the quarterback and asked him how they went. Uh, how did you feel that it went tonight? Uh, look, I, I feel good about it. Uh, this is an important way that voters get to kick the tires with me and with Senator Tillis, and especially as the new guy. Uh, they know his record. I'm still working to introduce myself to people. I think I was able to put a good foot forward tonight. These were really important questions, yeah. and I uh, appreciate the, uh, the stations doing this. So why, just in a nutshell, I know kind of there you were talking on specific issues, but if you and I were having a cup of coffee at your favorite place, and I said, why should I elect you over uh, Senator Tillis, you tell me why. I would say a couple of things. First of all, my story is very much the North Carolina story. This is a place that I love very dearly. It's going to be near to my heart when I go to Washington. We need reform in Washington. I have a history of, of taking on corruption, uh, working on uh, a, a reform. And I think, frankly, in order for the voters' voices to be heard in Washington, we, we need to shake things up up there. That's what I'd like to do. You know, to a degree, though, it is always, at least in the last generation or so, an uphill battle for a Democrat in that over the last generation, the voting for U.S. Senate and the voting for the president in the mm -hmm. same election cycle tends to be mirrored almost identical. And only one time has a Democrat won this state in the last 44 years. It was Barack Obama in 2008. And even then, it was only by uh, a third of a percent. So that's a 
<laughs> big way to get into this idea of is it an uphill battle for a Democrat to win this seat, especially against an incumbent? Well, here, here's what I would say. Uh, I'm a North Carolinian first. Mm -hmm. I'm a patriot first. As, as we talked about tonight, I've served in uniform overseas. I grew up in the small town of Lexington. I'm very deeply rooted in this North Carolina uh, that I love. Uh, and so it's, it's, a, it's about more than the, the, the partisan label beside, uh, beside me. It, it, I get it. I understand, and I'm willing to listen and engage and reach out, and it's okay if we don't agree on all the issues. I think there's so much that unites us as North Carolinians that it's exciting and, and a wonderful opportunity to serve uh, people, and I'm not going to check their voter registrations before offering to serve them. I want to get into one little more serious issue. You talk a lot about wanting to repeal Citizens United. That's yeah. the Supreme Court decision that allows what most people call unlimited money into campaigns. We're looking at a time right now where that kind of money could be valuable if uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg is replaced by a, a justice who might help overturn Roe v. Wade. Wouldn't someone in your position want Planned Parenthood, for example, to be able to spend money to argue their side of the case? Well, let me say this. Ed, we all should have and an exercise our First Amendment right to speak loudly in the political process. And, and frankly, throughout the history of this country, we have been loud and messy and, and cantankerous. And it's a beautiful part of who we are as, as, as a nation. Uh, the problem is the unlimited, unregulated corporate spending that is now taking place in our politics. We need donor disclosure. We need folks to stand by their ads. I mean, Bob, you saw it here in North Carolina earlier this year, a super PAC deceptively communicating in the Democratic primary. We should have that disclosure, and frankly, we should get the corporations out of our politics. Mr. Cunningham, thanks for your time tonight. Good luck with the rest of the campaign. Thank you, Bob. No. Our undecided voters in Charlotte are back in action, sharing their thoughts about the candidates, and they have a lot of them. All that and more coming up next on Post Debate Live. A U.S. Senate debate showdown. We should let the voters' voices be heard. I believe you deserve results, not empty promises or broken promises. The candidates on the attack. He lost the last time he ran for the Senate, and now he'll say anything to get elected. Senator Tillis is standing here on this stage tonight attacking my position because he has none. Heading towards an election too close to call. Tonight, live from Raleigh, our political analysts are tallying their debate scorecards. From your local election headquarters, this is Post Debate Live. Live from Raleigh and Charlotte, North Carolina, this is Post Debate Live. Whether you're just joining us or you've been with us from the top of the hour, we've still got a lot of information headed your way. Tonight, Republican incumbent Senator Tom Tillis and Democratic challenger Cal Cunningham went head to head on topics that impact you as well as your family. Live from Charlotte, a group of undecided voters will continue the conversation. And two analysts are here in Raleigh breaking down the impact of this debate, which could have national ramifications. We want to begin this half hour listening to our analysts. CBS 17 anchor Russ Bowen continues our coverage now. Russ. Mitch and April, thanks for being with us again tonight. It's been a very exciting night. So one of the topics that came up was marijuana, and they were asked about whether it should be legalized in the country, whether it's for recreational purposes or medicinal purposes. But it was this one question that's now trending on Twitter. We're talking about should the federal government legalize marijuana? Because marijuana is such a big issue, obviously you can tell in our poll. We're going to ask this question. Mr. Tillis, have you ever tried marijuana? Yes. When I was a kid, I was growing up in a trailer park. Mr. Cunningham, have you ever tried marijuana? Yes, I have when I was a young person. Both smiling, a little bit of levity there. I'm not sure that they expected that question, but it seemed like to me it was the most spontaneous either of them were tonight. Uh, April, do you think that this helped resonate with those younger voters, the millennials, that they both need to go to the polls? Well, definitely. I mean, if they had said something other than uh, yes, uh, people would have questioned whether they were, were, were being fully forthcoming. Um, and uh, it also kind of personalized them. Uh, it also demonstrated that they are in touch with what, you know, regular people are, are experiencing, particularly when it comes to um, marijuana use, which we know because uh, as far as the polling, and we had the poll numbers that were uh, put up, 
that most people believe that marijuana should be allowed for medicinal purposes, and a large swath believes that marijuana should be uh, legalized for recreational purposes. So I do think that their answers did help to personalize them, and if you want someone to vote for you, people have to be able to relate to you. Yeah, Mitch, honesty matters. It does, and this took that issue off the table. There's no difference between them on that particular item. To me, the most interesting part about this is you think back almost 30 years when this was still sort of an issue that could become a deal break for some folks. Bill Clinton caught flack when running for president talking about not inhaling, and so people said, well, what, what does that mean? How would you even uh, deal with marijuana that way? Now it's, now it's not an issue for politicians in this age group or younger. Uh, very interesting also what they would say on the actual policy. Cal Cunningham wants to basically make it a federalism issue, to take it off the federal register and let the states decide. And Tom Tillis, the incumbent, says that, you know, I'm interested in, in studying more and perhaps making cannabis and marijuana be the alternative to opioids because we have such an opioid problem. So they are both open to doing more with legalization involving marijuana and cannabis. And uh, that's very interesting to see in a state like North Carolina. I don't think you would have seen that 20, 30 years ago. Yeah, April, were you surprised by the polling? Um, not really. Well, actually, I was surprised that more people weren't in favor of recreational use of marijuana. Uh, but as far as medicinal purposes, not at all. There's a lot of research that suggests that um, it's incredibly helpful, particularly for people who have cancer. Um, so I wasn't surprised with that. Um, and uh, I do think, as um, uh, Mitch has indicated, uh, this is something where we're going to, I mean, there's been a, a lot that has been changed in terms of where, um, you know, people were thinking about marijuana 15, 20 years ago and the way it's viewed today. All right, guys, thanks so much. We're gonna see what else these, uh, our folks in Charlotte have to say. I'm very excited to see where they are on these next couple of questions. But in the meantime, Marius, we're gonna go back to you. Russ, thank you. Now we wanna head over to CBS 17's Angela Taylor, who is also a moderator tonight. She's joining us with a one-on-one -on -one conversation with incumbent Republican Senator Tom Tillis. Angela. Marius, thank you. All right, Senator Tillis, let's just get right into this. First, we appreciate you coming, being a part of this debate. How do you think that you did tonight? Well, I think we just continue to, to paint the stark contrast between me and my opponent, Cal Cunningham. I mean, it's really pointing out a number of times where he said what he thought he had to to get elected and then done something completely different once he was elected. So, Senator Tillis, what sets you apart from Mr. Cunningham? I think it starts with our backgrounds. I mean, we couldn't have a starker contrast. You know, all public schools, uh, 36 years before I get my degree. I've worked minimum wage jobs. I was out of home by the time I was 17 years old. Cal's led a blessed life. He went to Vanderbilt, Chapel Hill, London School of Economics. I don't think he's really connected to the people that are struggling the most, because honestly, if he was, I think he'd be hard pressed to be proud of the fact that he'd vote against the COVID relief package that we had on the floor just two weeks ago. How do you plan to fund the COVID relief measure? Well, the first, uh, the first one is a combination of using some of the funds we authorized in the first package mm -hmm. and then taking on some more debt. We're in a crisis time to where I'm always concerned about the debt, but, but this is a lot like World War II. We have to do what we have to do to get the population healthy and to stabilize the economy, because if we didn't, then we'd probably see a, a much higher deficit in the form of an economy that's shut down. That's why I'm concerned with what Joe Biden's talk about, shutting down the economy. It could create a hole that we couldn't dig out of for a decade. So, uh, Senator Tillis, you, I've gotten a lot of tweets since we, we started the debate, which was at seven o'clock. Um, a lot of people have tweeted at me and said, Senator Tillis, you had your chance, you failed us. So what do you say to those people that were watching, that are still watching? Well, what I'd say to a lot of them is remember the economy that they had in February, particularly if you're African-American or female or Hispanic with the highest employment that we've had since we started recording those numbers. Uh, remember the money we put back into your wallet, back into your pocketbook that was taken away through tax increases over the past. Uh, remember a hollowed out military that's been refunded uh, remember a, a candidate who will stand behind police officers versus an opponent who stands with people who are chanting abolish the police. At the end of the day, that's what matters. And those are all votes that I've taken on the floor and they're all votes that have helped people in North Carolina and across the country. All right, Senator Tillis, thank you. We appreciate you again being here with us. Thank you, I enjoyed it. 
Morris. Angela, thank you. Our coverage from Charlotte continues. After the break, we'll ask our group of undecided voters if tonight's debate helped them decide who to vote for. You don't want to miss that. You're watching Post Debate Live. Thanks for staying with us. We want to get back out to Charlotte, where we started with a group of undecided voters. We want to know if tonight's debate has helped sway their vote. Brian Blakely is standing by with this group of important voters. And Brian, a lot of people on social media are talking about the marijuana question. Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting that that's the number one topic on Twitter right, Twitter right now between a debate between Tillis and Cunningham. But that's also one of the things that the group of undecided voters here reacted to very strongly about was talking about the legalization of marijuana. And I want to go ahead and talk to Josh about that comment uh, tonight from the candidates as far as Tillis or Cunningham. What was your thoughts? So I think Cunningham had it perfect there where we should decriminalize it at a federal level, remove it from uh, Schedule One drug and allow states and localities to decide whether or not it should be legal. Um, as you saw from the data, 72 percent of North Carolinians thought it could be legalized for medical purposes and 48 percent for recreational. So I think he was right on when he said it should be up to the state government to legalize and tax it. Talking about a new next star, Emerson College poll. Josh, thank you. All right, we've talked about the issues as far as marijuana, also uh, health care and uh, the COVID response, and also with the filling of the Supreme Court. Those are some of the key issues that we've talked about tonight. Does that sway the voters, undecided voters here that we have in this room? Show of hands, did anybody get their needle swayed one way or the other on how you're going to vote? Okay, let's start right here with Shireen. I think I was more leaning toward Cunningham. I didn't feel like I got a good picture of who Tillis was based on the debate. I felt like he was doing more of kind of pretty much making Cunningham look bad or trying to defeat little things that he was saying. I didn't get a true picture of who he was, so I'm more leaning toward Cunningham for that very reason. Josh or Chris over here? Yeah, I thought uh, Tom Tillis talked about what he did in the Senate, and I think Cunningham uh, attacked uh, Tillis and didn't, didn't really come out with a position on the first half of the debate. It wasn't until the second half of the debate that Cunningham actually uh, talked about maybe what he was going to do. So this has really moved the needle for some people here about what's going to happen. Joseph, you had your hand up? Yes, I did. Mm -hmm. um, like I said before, I don't believe Tillis swayed me either way. Cunningham did, and because of his uh, main points where he took a stand, uh, it's way me away from him more. Away from him yeah, more? Yeah. Okay. Keisha? I think Cunningham did a better um, job of explaining what he was actually going to do. It did start off pretty slow in the beginning. The only thing I can remember from the Tillis point of view is that he kept harping on um, Cunningham's $80 million, and he kept not answering the question definitively or at all at some point. Um, a lot of you reacted negatively when people started attacking each yeah, other. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. It was more tit for tat for him versus any type of real answer to any of the real issues or questions that were being asked. And um, mm -hmm. I thought it was more antagonistic as well. Mm -hmm. um, but Cunningham did a better job for me of answering some of those issues. And I did like the fact that he's going to be working or partnering with Alma Adams for the HBCU initiative. Mm -hmm. Greta, were you swayed tonight? I was not. I thought it was extremely pejorative, um, and they were nitpicking with each other, and it's the same information that we hear on their ads every single day. The ads are wearing you out. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Noel, what about you? Uh, I have to agree. This was mainly a live version of their ads. It was just sound bite after sound bite and avoiding answering anything substantial. Anything substantial. And then, Christian, what about you? You come in as a 22-year-old voter here, and uh, have you made up your mind of what you're going to do in November? Um, I wouldn't say I've totally made up my mind. Uh, I think I was swayed a little more by Tillis. He, he seems to have a belief that he wants to let more constituents of the state as well as the individual states themselves decide what they should do. Uh, besides his opinion on the marijuana legalization, because I, I do believe that that should just be decriminalized altogether, uh, Cunningham seems to have more of a top-down federal control over the state's kind of belief and that just doesn't jive very well with me. 
Okay, Christy, thank you. Tiana, I want to go back here to you. Your thoughts, did you get swayed one way or the other tonight about what you're going to do November? Um, I think the moderators asked all the right questions. Um, I think it was... Uh, somewhat clear on what they believed if they actually answered the question. Uh, in terms of my personal opinion, did I get swayed? I don't know if I would necessarily say I got swayed, um, but I I think I know what I'm going to do. So, Will you tell us? Why would I do that? There's no fun <laughs> right. in that. Well, thank you then. All right. <laughs> and Josh, real quick? Um, I think Tillis avoided a lot of questions there um, all night long. He continued to want to use the same attacks against Cunningham. I think Cunningham took more of a stance on issues, um, and he hit Tillis where Tillis is weak, his hypocrisy between 2016 and now. Um, so I think Cunningham won the debate. I'm still undecided on who I will vote for. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you all of our undecided voters here tonight and watching the Tillis and Cunningham debate. You've been wonderful, and thank you for all your uh, thoughts tonight, and we certainly appreciate that, and good luck going forward here and making that decision. Marius, I want to send it back to you live in Raleigh. Brian, thanks so much. Now, keep in mind, these were undecided voters who heard both candidates tonight. The voters say some were pro-Cunningham, some were pro Tillis. Still, some were undecided. Now, let's get it back over to Russ Bowen here in Raleigh. He's standing by with our analysts. And Russ, are you surprised at all? I'm surprised more have not uh, at this point made a final decision, because if you don't know at this point, I don't know how you make the decision. And Mitch, I, I think you might agree with me. It's a really tough road ahead if you're an undecided still. Uh, but I think part of their frustration, and I get it, is that they were looking for substance and specifics. And some of these voters said they just didn't get it. And they seemed a little fed up with that. Yeah, a couple of things that really struck me as interesting in that last round with the undecided voters. One was that several of them suggested that this debate was much like a live version of their campaign ads, which reminds us that in a lot of respects, debates are about appealing to your base. They really aren't about talking about nuance or working across the aisle and different pieces of legislation and the pros and cons of them. They are more about here's what I think and here's why I'm better than the other person and that's a lot like the attack campaign ads and that rubs a lot of these undecided voters the wrong way which is why these debates oftentimes appeal more to the bases either the Republican base or the Democratic base the other thing that really struck out uh, stuck out to me was one of the voters Joseph he had really harped on Tillis not making a direct answer on the mask mandate. But then he also said in this last round that because Cunningham was more uh, ally or more able and willing to talk about his particular stands, that he was swayed more against Cunningham. So perhaps for this voter, Tillis was in better shape by not being more direct. It was very strange. April, one of the topics that came up just now with one of the voters who did seem to make a decision was that question about HBCU funding. You, of course, are a law professor at NC Central University here in North Carolina. Uh, you certainly can speak to the funding issue on a personal level, but did it stick out to you tonight at all? And do you think that resonated with some of the other voters who might attend those HBCUs or parents who have children who go there? Oh, absolutely. And I think Cunningham's response is indicative of how he responded throughout the debate. So he gave a lot of detail. He was talking about Alma Adams, Representative Adams, who he would be working with. He was able to name the number of HBCUs that we have here in North Carolina, um, which are 10. And he did that really throughout. And I think one of the reasons why the um, undecided voters were comparing Cunningham and Tillis was because Cunningham actually did give more substance to a lot of his answers. So even though he was a little bit more aggressive during this debate than he was the last debate, um, he was still able to give details and specifics about his views on the various topics that were discussed. Real quickly here, we have about a minute. Um, do you think that it helped or hurt if you had less or more experience as a public servant in public office, Mitch? I don't know that it made a huge difference. Tillis certainly has more experience, but Cunningham did very well in this debate as well. I think he certainly did better in this one than in the first one because he was able to jump right into it rather than sort of to seem to have to get his footing for a few minutes as he did the last time. April? Yeah, for this one, I'm going to say it hurts, right? So this particular seat, it's a one-term senator seat. So we had Senator Dole, who was the incumbent. She lost to Kay Hagan, who was the incumbent, who lost to Tom Tillis. And so now we're in a situation where Cal Cunningham is actually polling um, higher than Tillis. And so this may be a situation where um, being that incumbent actually does not help you in this situation. They had a lot of yes and no questions tonight. I'm going to ask you a name only question. Who won the debate tonight, Mitch? 
This debate only, I'd say Cunningham. April? Cunningham, definitely. Well, he must be feeling pretty good tonight. Uh, Mr. Tillis has some work to do, but we've got a long way to go between now and November the 3rd. A lot of speed people already voting, though, Marius. Russ, they are. Our undecided voters in Charlotte weren't the only ones talking. If you've used the hashtag NC Senate debate on social media and social media is on fire, your comment could be featured next. This is Post Debate Live. Now we've heard from the candidates, the analysts, the undecided voters, and now it's time to hear from you. Throughout the night, we've asked you to share your opinions of the debate on social media using the hashtag NC Senate debate. We want to share some of those with you now. Katie tweeted some common ground in the NC Senate debate. Both Cal for NC and Tom Tillis say they have tried marijuana. Probably one of the more memorable moments of tonight's debate so far. A lot of people have to agree. Deb wrote, wow, Cal and Tom really slinging the mud tonight in North Carolina. This Senate debate is brutal. And Tiffany had this to say. She wants to know if both of you, how can you believe in voting by mail when the post office doesn't even have the capability or capacity to deliver the packages and mail that they already have to deliver. We'd like to thank everyone for chiming in on social media and thanks for everyone who stayed with us for post debate live. Now you can continue our conversation on social media using the hashtag NC Senate debate. We'd like to thank our candidates, our analysts, and thanks so much to you for joining us. For everyone here in Raleigh and Charlotte, have a great night.